I just got a message. It's probably gonna change my life. No. It's gonna change my life. It's like mid-April and I'm in Florida and it's still cold. I mean, not like North Dakota cold, not Antarctica cold, but cold nonetheless. Way too cold for Florida. I didn't sign up for this, not mid-April. This is where I've spent an inordinate amount of my time over the past several years during the entire doctoral program. This building here has been my home, away from home. This place is like the hospital where I was born, my house, my old age home, and my graveyard for my bones. One eternity later. Three weeks later. For the longest time, I've been saying there are at least two things that life does not prepare you for. Number one, nothing that you've done so far in life, unless of course it's the thing I'm about to mention, prepares you for this. I know it's morbid, but we're gonna get to better things. Just bear with me. Nothing in life prepares you for being a pallbearer. <laughs> the first time you get that call, the first time you get a call, can you help me bury the dead? Can you help me put someone that you love in the ground? Can you help me carry their body, put it in a hole, and let dirt be thrown over it while you stand there and try to remain somewhat calm, somewhat reserved? It blew my mind the first time this happened. There was nothing that prepared me to carry a dead body. You know, it's, it's just one of those experiences in life that when that call comes, you just have to spring into action. There's no real preparing for that. 
at least in my opinion. I mean, you can do intellectual things. You can listen to this and say, well, now I'm a little more prepared because he's telling me I should be prepared for something like this. The thing is, the experience itself, it's not the knowing about it that it's coming in the future. It's the actual doing it. It's the weight of a casket in your hand as you're carrying that person and laying them to rest. That's the thing. It's not the intellectual part. Although that's tricky too. Now the second thing is much, much better. And uh, it's been on my mind because we just got back from Oklahoma City where one of our best friends got married. And uh, it was a very, very nice, warm Catholic service and the priest said that morning he kept making a mistake when he was called and asked what he was doing that day. He said, I I'm going to be doing a funeral later today. And of course, everyone in attendance chuckled because <laughs> there's sort of a truth to that in the sense that when you get married, a part of you needs to die in a good way, in, in a beneficial way. There's, there's a part of you that <clears throat> has to sacrifice for the other person. So some of your selfish tendencies have to die. So in, in this respect, there's an interesting segue that just happened from, from being a pallbearer to being a groom or a bride for that, for that matter. Um, I personally was not prepared for what being married actually meant, what being a groom actually meant. Sure, you watch movies, you hear other people talk about it, but when you talk to married people, they usually tell you, look buddy, or look pal, look chief, <laughs> look gal. Um, what you're about to get into, it's experiential. There's not good words Marriage does not lend itself easily to language, and neither does death. Um, but there's something beautiful that happens, a sacrifice that's in that word, of course, is built in this meaning of a struggle, a, a tearing away of something that, that means something to you for someone else. A sacrifice that hurts, otherwise it wouldn't be a sacrifice. But recently, I got a third call. Hey, you know how I went to the doctor because I thought I was sick? We need to talk. There's nothing else quite like it. Because you're definitely not prepared when you get the call and you find out. You probably can't tell what that is. When I look at it, I can't really tell what that is. But what I'm told that it is, is that this is my unborn child. This is my, my the first picture of my baby. Nothing prepared me for this moment. The moment when I found out that we are bringing another life into this world. Immediately, you start thinking, or I did anyway, you may not, but I start thinking, oh my goodness, what am I gonna do? How am I gonna prepare my life for this life? How am I going to <laughs> get my crap together in nine months? I have to have it together so that I can provide for this life in a way that <sighs> brings the most amount of protection, the most uh, provision possible, the safest environment, the most enriching environment, for both that, tr that child and my wife and myself. 
you have to create an environment where this life can self-actualize. And nothing prepares you for that call. <laughs> the theme of this is that, or the message that I'm trying to get across, is that you are going to get calls in your life that you are not entirely prepared for. So what do you do? Well, I've already stated that you can't quite prepare for them. But what you can do is start working on yourself. You can start working on your accountability. You can start taking responsibility. You know, I talk to university students almost on a daily basis. And there seems to be this recurring theme in the conversations that I have with them, whether it's related to our class in a theory paper that they're writing that relates to their life, they write about their relationships, they write about the lack of meaning in their life, and I'm not trying to overgeneralize at all, but what I am saying is, I think that I've noticed there's, I've, I've had thousands of students at this point, and I've had, I don't know how many clients uh, who came to see me for individual or group therapy. And I do think that there is a surprising lack of meaning in a large swath of the population's lives. Now, it's certainly not everyone. There are a lot of people out there who are living maximally meaningful lives. But if you're one of those individuals who, who isn't quite living a life that's as enriching and as meaningful as you think it could be, I just lay out this challenge that life has a way of throwing really terrible things your way and really positive things your way but the very structure of life and reality is that it's full of suffering. It's built into the fabric. If you don't do anything, you're going to suffer. You come out of your mother's womb crying. You suffer. That is a baseline truth about life. I know that's not great. This, that's not going to get me... PewDiePie viewers or anything like that, and that's not what this is about. I'm not PewDiePie, obviously. All I'm saying is that this life is going to give you enough bad things on its own without you having to work for it. But there are few opportunities. The sunlight will not always shine on you. I wish that it would, but that's not the way life works. There's only a few exceptional people. These, these rare, exceptional... These rare, exceptional lives that have that are just bathed in promise and opportunity and everything seems to go their way and whatever they, they try to do, it just prospers. And that's awesome for them, great for them. They should inspire you in a way. It shouldn't make you look at your own life and despise yourself. But I think that's very easy to do. That's certainly something that I've done before is look at someone who who has a really great life from your perspective. You don't know what it's like for them in their shoes, but from your vantage point, you look at them and you say, ah, their life is amazing. It looks amazing. I wish my life was more like theirs. There are a few people out there who just are bathing in opportunity and prosperity, health, 
can have seemingly unlimited good things happen to them. But the truth is, life will catch up with them. They will run out of negative entropy. <laughs> Something will catch them inevitably. That's the way life works. A call will come for them. If it's not to be a pallbearer, if it's not to be a husband or a wife, if it's not to be a mother or a father, there will come a call in their life, and in your life, and in my life, that ends all calls. I, I know, again, that's a terribly morbid thing. But what I'm, I'm trying to encourage you to think about is one of the ways that you cultivate meaning is by taking on responsibility. I know that that's not popular, I know that it's not exciting, but if you want your life to be more meaningful, do you think that you're going to find it in more expensive food? So he here's the thing. I've been working on this idea called the myth of there and then. I've talked to enough students and clients that there seems to be this abiding myth that somewhere out there in the future, some distant moment from now, that everything is going to come together in such a way that you're just going to be happy there and then. The stars are going to align for you. And maybe that is the case. I hope that it is the case. But what about right now? Why put off the right nows for, for all the potential there and thens? It's a myth. I think, I don't think there is a there and then where everything's just going to come together and be perfect for that time. I think we strive for that for some reason. That's certainly something that I'd like to explore in future iterations or other videos. Not now, because this is getting a bit lengthy. But the myth of there and then causes people to think that I can put off maximizing meaning in my life today. I don't have to be maximally responsible for things because there's this future-oriented point in life. And when I get there, I'll already be prepared for everything that I need in that moment to be happy, to be joyful, to be excited about life. And I think the truth is pretty much the opposite. If you look at the research, what you find is that you're really becoming more and more the person that you're going to be each and every day. You're, high, you're, you're literally wiring your, your neural circuitry. Um, you're causing neural pathways to reinforce themselves, to further ingrain themselves in the habits that you do habits that you have, the behaviors that you enact in the world. So I think the likelihood that you could be one person this day and without some dramatic intervention occurring, that you would then be so much happier there and then. Like for instance, winning the lottery, that would be a dramatic occurrence in a person's life. The only problem is that the research shows that if not most, certainly many of those individuals who win the lottery, they have a dramatic spike and then they return to their baseline after a couple of years. Which essentially says that even when you experience a really great thing, you might think, oh, if I win the lottery, I'd be super happy. And that's true, you probably would be for a while. But guess what? comes back down to your baseline. And it's also true of people who go through tragedies. 
and this is certainly something that I'd love to talk more about, but even people who go through brutal things experience atrocities that you and I can't imagine. After a while, return to something like their baseline. So there really is something about who you are and who you're becoming. So I want to be working on myself right now to open my eyes and enjoy the life that I have right now because it's so short, it's so fleeting. Maybe yours won't be. Maybe you'll be with Raymond Kurzweil in the singularity, right? Maybe you'll be one of those who live long enough to live forever. I hope that's the case. But if it isn't, you better be working right now instead of waiting for there and then. I had a colleague of mine recently. He's a very wealthy guy. He left his career and has come back to academia because he wants to get a PhD. His kids are out of the house and now he's interested in his legacy. What's my legacy going to be? And he was walking down the hall and he heard some of us talking, pops in the office and, what are you guys talking about? And we're just talking about our dream jobs. And we got into a discussion of finances. He was telling us with his company, one of the things that he did was facilitate these really big deals with pharmaceutical companies. And in a given day, after you know an hour, hour and a half to three hour long meeting, he'd walk away with a six figure check. So he was telling me, he said, here's the thing though, you get to a point of diminishing returns. You get to something like anhedonia where one more bite of ice cream isn't going to make you happy. You're already as satiated with that as you're going to get. So more is not better at that point. He said to me, he said, look, my wife wanted a new vehicle. We got a new vehicle. It was insanely expensive. And he said, it hit me while we were driving. He was like, how much more happiness am I getting by paying this amount for this vehicle? Going out to eat, he said, we were, we were buying more and more expensive steak every time. And he said, eventually we were paying so much for it. I was like, how much better can this steak be than something that's less expensive? All of that to say, it's your meaning, your purpose, your value, your happiness is probably not going to be attached to more and more money. You certainly need enough. I think um, pretty much what what the consensus is now from the data is that somewhere around, economists say, around $70,000 is probably about the sweet spot. You need about that much to, to, to get distance from the wolves coming at your door. Uh, if there's an emergency, something bad happens. Uh, about $70,000. And that's a lot, right? But there are people who make way more and way less. But that seems to be about the sweet spot where if you make that, making more than that doesn't make you dramatically happier. That's the point I'm trying to make, is that that seems to be about a baseline in our, in our current economic system where if you make it to that point, making more than that, it's maybe an incremental gain, right? There are massive things you could do but in terms of your own personal happiness and the meaning that you have in your life, maybe it won't move the needle as much as you think that it would. Uh, what about more love in your life? Having more than one significant other, 
perhaps you think that that's going to bring you happiness. Maybe it will for a time, right? But what I'm trying to say is that chasing things, chasing these pursuits, pursuing more and more of a given thing has the opposite kind of effect. It's paradoxical in that way. The more and more of something that you get, we're sort of hardwired, I think, um, to, to kind of level out, right? So there's a point at which what's, what's one more one night stand? What's it going to do for you? What's one more date with a model going to do for you? Because at the end of the day, at the individual level of consciousness, you're alone in this world. You can try to drink that away. You can try to smoke that away. You can try to pray that away. You can sleep your way through your city. And I don't actually mean sleep, (laughs) if you know what I mean. But you can sleep your way through your city. You can buy and sell daily things that the rest of us couldn't imagine. But some of the happiest people I've ever met in my life are in the developing world where they cultivate meaning based on the amount of responsibility that they've taken on. And, and do not misunderstand what I'm saying. I don't have some kind of mythical notion of the noble savage, right? I've lived there. It's hard. It's extremely hard in certain circumstances where there's not uh, potable water near you, where there are not resources that you and I might take for granted in, in, in the West, in the US or Western Europe or Canada or even Mexico, although there are certain some spots in Mexico, and even in the US and Canada and, and Western Europe, that, that there are areas, there are pockets where things are really rough, right? But my father, his family didn't have electricity. They were poor farmers. And so when I went to the developing world, I had sort of a mentality already uh, about what that was going to be like based on knowing and growing up with my grandparents and knowing my my father, right? Who basically thought that we should live uh, <laughs> as close to the bone as possible. And, and we did. I raised pigs growing up. That's the way that people in areas like where I'm from got by. We picked crops, whatever was in season, that's what we were picking. We raised livestock. They still do it now. Very few people from where I'm from get out and do some kind of different thing with their lives. Most people stick close by and and guess what? When I go home and visit, the level of happiness, the disparity between the happiness I see in the city and the happiness that I see there is, uh, it's shocking really. But part of it is because they've taken responsibility, they've embedded themselves within communities, they're working hard to better their own lives and the lives of other people. And that's certainly what I experienced in the developing world as well. And, you know, when you, if you ever meet someone who has to walk eight miles to get clean drinking water, then, then it changes you. I know a guy who, who worked for Samaritan's Purse in, in the Sudan. And, um, he told, he told me when he got back, um, he was, uh, he was getting engaged and he had one responsibility when he got back to the States and excuse me, his job I have a 
friend who was working for Samaritan's Purse in the Sudan. He was helping rebuild roads and helping them create infrastructure, especially after the really terrible floods that they had several years ago. And when he got back stateside, he and his significant significant other got engaged. And he had one task. She gave him one task. And that task was to go out and get a blender. Well, he had been living in Sudan for so long that I remember walking through the, the apartment door and sitting my stuff down. We were in Chicago at the time and he was sort of balled up in the corner in a fetal position. And I said, hey man, what's wrong? And he was like, do you have any idea how many blenders there are? It was sort of a non sequitur. I was like, what are you talking about? And he said, I had to go shopping for a blender today. Do you know how many there are? I mean, there's, it depends on where you go, I guess. There's, there can be many, there could be few, depends. He's like, there's so many. They come in different shapes, sizes, colors. Which one do I get? I have no idea. There are too many choices. There's a metaphor there for life, I think. And in some ways, he was happier in Sudan. And again, that is not making light of how terrible it is. Right? It, that's not it. The point I'm making is that he was trying to take on the responsibility of how bad it was and do something about it. That's where the meaning came from, was doing the hard thing. I'm not glorifying how bad the situation is. No, I'm doing the opposite. I'm saying trying to ameliorate suffering in the world is hard, but that's taking on responsibility and it's incredibly meaningful. And I'll leave you with this. He told me when he was living there, he used to have to take a particular antibiotic, antibiotic Cipro, Ciproflaxin, he said he had to take it every day. He said he had to take it like a vitamin. I said, why? Why, why would you have to take it like a vitamin? Um, and he, he sort of changed, you know, his face changed, his body language changed. And he told me this story about a kid who walked 16 miles to bring him water. And he said when he looked at that water, when they poured it into the glass, you could just see things swimming in it. You could see just gunk and debris. And he looked at me and he said, how could I not drink this water? It took him hours to get this. He went so far out of his way. He carried this for miles for me. How could I not drink it? He took on the burden of responsibility to make things better for my friend by bringing him fresh water. My friend in return was trying to build roads and bridges and infrastructure so that it would make life easier in the future. So when that kid needed to go get water, there would be infrastructure there. There would be wells, there would be drinkable water. So both of their lives were increasing in happiness and joy and meaning despite the suffering because they took on responsibility and they were trying to ameliorate suffering in the world. That kind of mutuality, that kind of reciprocity is amazing. And I'm inviting you just as I am myself, I'm not immune from this. I have to do it every day. I have to wake up and decide that I'm going to take on more responsibility. I think that's probably enough for one video because...
I got my hands full. Thank <laughs> you.